So what are we going to talk about today? Um, I want to give you a broader perspective of Hawaiian homes. It's more than just housing. Uh, give you a little bit of perspective if you're not familiar with development. Why does it take so long? Why do people stay on the list so long? And um, to talk about our funding, in particular the Nelson case and its significance to DHHL, and when the you know when sufficient doesn't actually mean um, what it says in the dictionary as it relates to DHHL, and then the changes ahead. So just by way of background, Hawaiian Homelands is not like any other state agency. Um, our program, the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, was established in 1921. It's called the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act of 1920. Uh, principally, the person that lobbied for that or worked for that was Prince Jonah Kuhio Kalaniana Ole. Um, what I want us to focus on specifically is the relationship of the federal government to the state government as it relates to the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. So the first thing is, next slide, within our Admissions Act, which is the act that allowed for Hawaiian home, uh, for the state of Hawaii um, to become a part of the state, in that Admissions Act, there is a specific requirement that as a compact or a contract with the United States relating to the management and disposition of the Hawaiian homelands, the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act 1920 as amended shall be adopted as a provision of the constitution of said state subject to amendment or repeal only with the consent of the United States and no, in no other ma manner. And then it says provided that, and then there's a lot of provisions that um, qualify that amendment to the United States, I mean the requirement of the consent from the United States. So the reason why this is significant is because there is a tie back to the federal government as it relates to the administration of this program. It's very unique in the history of uh, state programs as well as in the federal context. That tie back to the federal government of that trust responsibility that was delegated from the federal government to the state government is really a foundation piece of our federal relationship um, with the United States. And the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act is kind of the, gra the granddaddy of all of the programs that came following uh, related to this trust obligation. So this compact is really important. Next slide. Article 12, section two, which is within our state constitution, is where we as a state accept this responsibility. And what I want to point out is um, a lot of people are under the impression that that responsibility is just with Hawaiian Homes and the commission uh, that heads up Hawaiian Homes. But when you actually look at the language, it says the state and its people to further agree and declare that the spirit of the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, looking to the continuance of the Hawaiian Homes Project for the further rehabilitation of the Hawaiian, homes, of the Hawaiian race, shall be faithfully carried out. It's the state, collectively, all of us. So it's not just Hawaiian homes. We have the day-to-day uh, -day responsibility and a lot of the decision-making is done by the commission, but that language encompasses both state legislators, DLNR, CWRM, all of the state, all of, our, all of the state actors, as well as the people as a whole. So we accepted this responsibility as a state upon our admission into, the, into uh, the United States. Next slide. The other piece, which is gonna become significant as we move along, is Article 12, Section 1, um, which has to do with the funding of DHHL. And there's a, we'll have contact information at the end if you want um, copies of this PowerPoint. So, um, so in any case, Article 12, Section 1 was amended in the 1978 Constitutional Convention to ensure that sufficient funding would be made available for the purposes under the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. Um, and this is just all foundation, so you have this in the back of your mind as we move forward. Um, those sufficient sums are to ma be made available for four purposes. The first is development of home, agricultural, farm, and ranch lots. The second is home, agricultural, aquacultural, farm, and ranch loans. The third is rehabilitation projects. So this is very expansive to include 
but not limited to educational, economic, political, social, and cultural processes by which the general welfare and conditions of Native Hawaiians are thereby advanced. Very broad. And then the last is the administration and operating budget of the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Four purposes, lots, loans, rehabilitation projects, administration and operating budget of the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. The language of Article 12, Section 1. So we're gonna come back to this because it's important in terms of where we are with the funding of DHHL. What I wanna leave you with, if nothing else from this section, is that the Department of Interior has become, I mean, they've always been an important player as it relates to Hawaiian homes, but um, with the new federal rules, Part 47, which governs land exchanges, and Part 48, which deals with the amendments to the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, um, the process is a lot more complicated uh, as it relates to amending the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act or getting land exchanges changed. So it's really important if you're a beneficiary to get to know the Office of Native Hawaiian Relations staff. Stanton Enamoto and Lisa Oshiro, they may be actually here at the conference, I saw Stanton yesterday, because when it comes to the rules, it's really about how DOI interprets the rules. Not DHHL, not any organization, not any state legislature, because these rules are actually Department of Interior's rules. So it's good to hear it directly from the horse's mouth because um, how they interpret it may not be the same way we might interpret it or you might interpret it, okay? So I just leave that with you because at the end of the day, there's been a lot more complexity in any kind of amendment to the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. Next slide. Moving forward, I wanna talk about where our lands are because <laughs> I know this is like, <laughs> You may not think that this is a real thing, but we do have people on our list that are waiting for places like Aiea. And we don't have any land in Aiea or Mililani. Um, so I just wanna kinda go through where our lands are so you have an idea of where, cause we can only develop, pretty much develop where we have lands, which seems logical, but you'd be surprised. Um, just by way of background, um, the way, the way that Hawaiian homes, homelands came into existence, um, when you actually look at the act, it identifies these ahupua'a, these are the traditional lands that, were, that came into our inventory in 1920. So it says, let's say the ahupua'a of, of Kahikinui. Um, so it says, there are lands that were available for Hawaiian homelands that were certain tracts of public lands, minus the forest lands, minus the sugarcane lands, and minus lands that were already leased. So what was left available is what became Hawaiian homelands, okay? As most of you know, these lands were generally very remote, more difficult to develop, windy, hot, etc. the traditional lands. However, 100 years later, those windy and hot lands are very good for alternative energy development. So there are pluses and minuses to the lands that were set aside in the original inventory. Following up on that, in 95, we had a number of additional parcels that came into Hawaiian homelands as part of the settlement that DHHL reached with the state of Hawaii. So I'm gonna kind of go quick, quickly through the inventory so you can kind of see where our lands actually are. Starting with Kauai, um, we have lands, uh, and let me, let me focus on the lands where we're gonna be having development moving forward. So we have lands in Moloa'a and Anohola and Kamalomalo. Our most um, residential developments are happening in Anohola. Waialua, Kapa'a is a commercial. Waialua actually is very attractive to our waiting list. However, the infrastructure cost for us to open up that lands is pretty expensive. Um, we've recently gotten funding from the legislature for Hana Pepe and Waimea. We actually are going to be opening up sooner than we expected because of the water agreement that the governor had mentioned that will allow for us to be able to open that lands um, in part due to investment into the infrastructure that's being made by KIUC. Next slide. Oahu, um, where we have lands, of course, of course people are familiar with our 
why not? I mean, our west side lands, why not? Some, some properties in Luluale, Nanukuli, which is our biggest homestead, Kapole, of course, those lands from Kapole came into our inventory, were either purchased and brought into our inventory or as part of the land settlement. Kalailoa, which is our industrial holdings. Waiava, which is actually, um, we are in discussion with the city regarding uh, those properties going to assist in um, the rail facility in exchange for properties that are near to Makanali'i, if you're familiar with the shopping center. And so those land, land exchange discussions are going on. Shafter Flats, which is right off the uh, freeway as you're heading towards the airport, one of our bigger income producing parcels. Kapolama, um, anybody eat at Young's? Young's Fish Market? Okay, that's actually on the homelands, um, the property under that. Moilili, which is actually the old Bolodrome site. We will be looking at uh, redeveloping that parcel for rental housing. Um, we're looking at mixed use, so for commercial properties to help subsidize the rentals. Waimanalo, it looks like it's a lot of acreage, 1,906 acres, but those are the cliffs, yeah. <laughs> um, Availimu, Kalavahine, Kevalo, Papakolea. People drive by, I think it's one homestead, but it's actually three, three different homesteads. Um, and then Haiku, which is if you're driving over the H3, all, a lot of that acreage is actually Hawaiian homelands. We've started the process to look at what it'll take to uh, bring that into homestead production. So um, looking at the environmental issues initially, and then Waiohole. Next slide. Molokai, um, these were where our program started. Ho'olehua, Kalamaula, Kapa'akea, Walapu'e. For the first time in a long time, we've got resources for development in Ho'olehua. Um, and then in the next year, we're going to be starting discussion about um, access and the Mo'omomi lands. And so that's up towards Kalaupapa. Lanai, we have 50 acres, um, a small homestead and some commercial and some industrial properties uh, that came into our inventory in the 90s. Maui. So Maui, um, we have Kahikinui, um, which is this big piece over here. Our only homestead that is a, what's called a Kuliana Homestead Program. Kula, where a lot of our development is happening up country. Um, we have some of these properties that are near to Kihei, um, but they're a little bit more remote. Pulehu Nui, which is kind of in the neck, um, under development for a master plan along with DLNR. Um, Honokawai, which is where we're looking to do subsistence ag on the west side. What's not on this map are our Lealii properties that we got um, in the 90s and are actually looking at doing the next phase, phase 1B. On the back side, Weohu, Paukukalo, and Wailuku is this very small, very small a piece of property. So most of our homesteads there in Waiahu and Paukukalo. And then our East Maui properties, Kanai, Wailua, and Waikiu, um, you know, those are very unique because a lot of the beneficiaries who live in that area really want that to stay in hands from families that are from that, arena, that area. So how those lots are awarded, we're still in discussion with those beneficiaries if the rules need to be looked at to uh, uh, adjust that. Next slide. Big Island, this is where most of our properties are. So um, we own both South Point, as well as 50,000 acres, the one that kind of looks like a candle in the middle. We call those our Aina Mauna legacy lands, right on the slopes of Mauna Kea. Um, Kealakehe, we have some development going on on the Kona Coast moving up. Kauai Hai, you'll see is another big chunk, 5,000 acres there, 10,000 acres there, and then, um, Many of our, what we call Waimea Nui, that's kind of in the middle, a lot of that property is actually already leased out um, to pastoral and agricultural users. And then coming down this way, you see Honomu, it's kind of like a little spot above where the, it looks like the dog's eye is. That's where we're looking at, Honomu is where we're looking at doing our first uh, subsistence ag, um, big kind of master plan project. Um, and then as you move down, you see the properties in Keokaha and um, our most familiar Panaeva and Keokaha and Hilo, and then of course Moku'u, um, which is where we have a lot of our uh, ag lots as well. So kind of, you know, it's 
Um, it's good to kind of know where our properties are, because even though I was joking in the beginning, if you're waiting for some place that we don't, don't have homelands, the homestead's not going to be coming anytime soon.